it's really interesting to see how many foods are now today being thought of as toxic or as not good for us. You know, for example, wheat. And wheat is the staff of life. And now we say, oh, no, wheat's not a good food. We shouldn't be eating wheat. And no one's thinking about maybe there's something in the wheat now that there didn't used to be there that's causing this problem. Are you still there, Hank? Yeah, kid. They sprayed us good, huh? Yeah, good. I never thought we'd get sprayed in the garden. <laughs> but we'll be okay, huh? I mean, we've been sprayed before, huh, Hank? Sure, kid. But I've got to tell you, my roots hurt real bad. Hank, whoever did this is going to pay. Hank, they're going to pay big. Hank, Hank. Roundup kills weeds where others can't. Roundup, no root, no weed, no problem. Roundup, you probably have in your garage at the moment or in your tool shed. You probably spray it on your grass. Your sports grounds are probably sprayed with it. Your parks are sprayed with it. Many of our foods are sprayed with it. It's everywhere. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in the pervasive herbicide Roundup, which is used uh, in chemical agriculture extensively and also used on people's lawns. And it's uh, unregulated, um, very poorly monitored actually, and very poorly measured. The glyphosate in the wheat is causing such a train wreck in the body that um, it's no wonder that we can't eat the wheat. We're seeing multiple different problems of the gut on the rise today in children as well as in uh, elderly people. Everybody, really, all ages are being affected. And I think the glyphosate is a major player in that problem. My big concern about Roundup is uh, what it does to the gut flora. And once you've got your gut flora me messed up, then digestion becomes very, very difficult. Now the argument in favor of using glyphosate that humans shouldn't worry about is because glyphosate only affects plants and bacteria. Okay, we are 10 times more bacteria than we are human cells. Therefore, glyphosate becomes a major issue for us to be real concerned about. They say we don't have the shikimate pathway as humans, which is what is disrupted in plants when plants get killed by Roundup. We have that pathway through the bacteria in our gut. The shikimate pathway is a process that happens in plants and bacteria and it converts fructose that we consume into a compound called PEP which then through a series of steps makes our beautiful aromatic proteins or amino acids which then turn into our neurotransmitters. 90% of our neurotransmitters are made in the gut. If we don't have the bacteria that make these neurotransmitters through the shikimate pathway, then we don't have enough neurotransmitters and therefore our brains don't work as well as they could. We don't think as well as we could. And it's amazing how many things come from the shikimate pathway, including, for example, folate, which is an essential B vitamin, and vitamin K, and um, serotonin, melatonin, melanin, dopamine, um, epinephrine, these are all really, really important molecules in the nervous system. So as my journey continued in the discovery of why wheat could be such a bad thing when we needed it for culture and tradition, and I realized that not only were we destroying the plant and the nutrition of the plant and how we were consuming this plant, but we were also destroying our body's ability to digest it. And so you put those two combinations together and what you're left with is the perfect storm of insidious events with our health that are being caused as a result of us playing with nature. The fact that now we're growing it in a way where we're putting in, I guess, poisons would be the correct term for it, um, can't be serving anyone's health for the better. So as our society changes to one that is um, much more focused on, you know, work hard, play hard, and we sacrifice sleep, we sacrifice time in our own heads, we sacrifice stress management, at the same time as our diets are getting more and more nutrient void and richer and richer in inflammatory compounds, we are creating a perfect storm of events for chronic illness, and we are seeing not just an increase in celiac disease and gluten sensitivity, but we're seeing an increase in just about every chronic illness that we have the capacity to diagnose. We've exchanged 
infectious disease for chronic disease. And instead of appreciating where our technology would take us in, you know, being able to bathe more frequently and have refrigerators and, 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 and have more sanitation uh, and get us away from infectious disease and enjoy that, we simply let that pendulum swing clear over to, uh, to chronic and now we have type 2 diabetes and obesity and uh, you know, autism is through the roof. Wheat is contributing to an inflammatory state in our bodies, both by being inherently inflammatory and also by displacing foods in our diet that would allow us to have a more robust immune system. Even the poor are getting diabetes because they're living on a starch diet without any balance in their diet. I mean, a typical diet is, you know, pasta, bread, pizza crust, uh, and then uh, shredded wheat for breakfast and biscuits and muffins and all of that requires insulin to digest and so you're just uh, creating a, a perfect situation for diabetes to develop. There is an overlap of all these symptoms going on and these reactions can manifest as any group of symptoms under the sun. It can be a migraine headache, it can be an asthma attack, it can be a panic attack, it can be depression, it can be mood swings, it can be a skin rash, it can be a cystitis, it can be a nephropathy, it can be anything. You just can't continue to douse your food with neurotoxins and not expect it to show up in the human population. Simply thinking should make us head down a different path. In the wheat grain, it may not just be the gluten and the gliadin that is the problem, the, the, the proteins in our wheat. We also had sugar in the wheat, and that sugar is called fructan. And when we chop fructan up into little pieces, that's fructose. And one of the diseases that we're, or maladies that we're now seeing is fructose malabsorption. We're starting to understand that irritable bowel syndrome is at least in many cases is actually fructose malabsorption. So it's actually our bodies not being able to absorb fructose effectively and overfeeding bacteria. So we used to consume uh, large amounts of fructose for all of our existence, but we ate it in complex, in a natural food, such as a piece of fruit, which has millions of other substances in it and they're all necessary. They all balance each other out. If you take fructose out and present it on its own as a molecule to the human body, that can become toxic. The input to the shikimate pathway is PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate. And the step that glyphosate disrupts is the very first step that converts PEP to the next thing in the chain. And PEP is also the output of a pathway that breaks down fructose. So ordinarily, the gut microbes take in fructose convert it to PEP, and then the PEP supplies the input to the shikimate pathway. But what happens when glyphosate's in the way is that PEP piles up. And when PEP piles up, it's going to suppress the ability of the microbes to continue to break down the fructose. So the fructose is gonna end up in the lower gut and get processed into fat by the microbes in the lower gut, producing gas, for example. And if those microbes are not sufficient to manage all the fructose that's being eaten, then the fructose is going to go to the liver and the liver is going to have to process the fructose into fat also. And in doing so, the liver will become either fatty liver or it will release a lot of LDL particles giving you high cholesterol. Even if we were to right this moment just suddenly ban glyphosate, the soil itself would also be an issue because glyphosate in some soils, it can last over 20 years.